years. So we just did Isaiah 21. Now we're going to go into Isaiah 29, the illiterate prophets or the illiterate nomo. Right. So we're going to start this off um, by reading the entire chapter of uh, Isaiah 29. So I'm not going to read it. Uh, some guy that I just met on the internet, Sir Frankfurt Falafel, is going to read this for you. So please enjoy. Hello, once again, I'm Sir Frankfurt Falafel, and I'm going to read to you an excerpt from Isaiah chapter 29. Ah, Ariel, Ariel, the city where David encamped. Add year to year, let the feasts run their round. Yet, I will distress Ariel, and there shall be moaning and lamentation, and she shall be to me like an Ariel. And I will encamp against you all around, and, with this, and will besiege you with towers, and I will raise siege works against you, and you will be brought low. From the dust of the earth you shall speak, and from the dust your speech will be bowed down. Your voice shall come from the ground like the voice of a ghost, and from the dust your speech shall whisper. But the multitudes of your foreign foes shall, shall be like small dust, and the multitudes of the ruthless like passing chaff. In an instant, suddenly, you will be visited by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with whirlwind and tempest and the flame of a devouring fire, and the multitudes of the nations that fight against Ariel, all that fight against her and her stronghold and distress her shall be like a dream, a vision of the night. And when a hungry man dreams, and behold, he is eating, and awakes with his hunger not satisfied. Or when a thirsty man dreams, and behold, he is drinking, and awakes faint. With his thirst not quenched, so the multitudes of all the nations that fight against Mount Zion is true. Astonish yourselves, and be astonished. Blind yourselves, and be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink, for the Lord has poured upon, poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep, and has closed your eyes, and covered your heads, and the visions of all this has come to you like the words of a book that has been sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, Read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, Read this, he says, I cannot. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with the mouth and honor me with the lips, while the hearts are far from me. The fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder and wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you, who hid deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, Who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay? That the things made should say of its maker, he did not make me. Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. It is not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruit field. And the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest. In that day the death shall hear the words of a book. And out of the gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease, and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off, who by a word make a man out to be an offender, and lay snare for him who reproves in the gate, 
and with an empty plea turn aside him who is in the right. Therefore, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall no more be ashamed, no more shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Israel and will stand in awe of the glory of Israel. And those who go astray in spirits will come to understanding, and those who murmur will accept instruction. Very good. Thank you to Mr. Falafel for reading the entire chapter for us. Uh, gives us some context of what mm -hmm. we're going to be looking at. Of course, the Muslim will only want to look at one particular verse for some odd reason, not the entire passage. Yeah, and uh, speaking of speaking of that, there is a particular Muslim who um, is going to respond and explain to us how um, this particular verse about this person who cannot read um, how it is directly related to Surah Seven, Ayah one hundred and fifty-seven. And after you have been refuted by Isaiah twenty-one. I'm also going to refute you from Isaiah 29. This is where we talk about the illiterate prophet. In Surah 7, Ayah 157, it says that you will find the unlettered prophet, or it could also be translated as the illiterate prophet, written about in your scriptures. So, look. We see exactly the same words in Isaiah 29, where it says that someone will be handed a book and they will say, I cannot read. That is confirmation that Isaiah 29 is talking about the literate prophet, which is talking about it from uh, um, Quran chapter 7, Ayah 157. There is no more proof that you need. It says a literate prophet, a literate person who cannot read and and then we read in the Bible that there's an illiterate prophet coming who cannot read. You cannot refute that argument. There you go. You got the exact same words. I mean, what could be stronger indication than that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's a it's a pretty, pretty solid, pretty solid argument. Um, so what, what we're doing here, guys, is we're kind of building up um, the context of what the actual passage says. We're, we're hearing from a real life Muslim. Uh, who is trying to say, look, this is clearly about Muhammad in Surah 7, Ayah 157. Um, and we're going to hear from him actually a little bit later how this, this I can't read, this illiterate prophet thing, um, is actually written about in, um, in the Sahih Hadith collection. Um, so instead of having Mr. Muslim read it, I actually was able to find a video of uh, Sir Frankfurt Falafel reading um, the the uh the passage um which i'll, I'll let sir frankford falafel give give the introduction of of the passage hello <clears throat> hello i'm sir frankford falafel and today i'm going to read to you a story called muhammad gets a bear hug is from Sahih al-Bukhari, number 69, 82. The commencement of the divine inspiration to Allah's messenger was in the form of good, righteous dreams in his sleep. He never had a dream but that it came true like bright daylight. He used to go to seclusion, the cave of Hira, where he would worship Allah alone, continually for many days and nights. He used to take with him on the journey food for that stay, and then come back to his wife, Khadija, to take his food. Likewise again for another period to stay, till suddenly the truth descended upon him while he was in the cave of Hira. The angel came to him in it, and ask him to read. The prophet replied, I do not know how to read. 
The angel caught me forcefully and pressed me so hard that I could not bear it any more, Muhammad said. He then released me and again asked me to read, and I replied, I do not know how to read. Whereupon he caught me again and pressed me for a second time till I could not bear it any more. He then released me and asked me again to read, but I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he caught me for a third time, impressed me, and then released me and said, Read in the name of your Lord who has created, has created man from clot. Read in your Lord is most generous up to that which he knew not. And then Allah's messenger returned with the inspiration his neck muscles twitching with terror. He entered upon Khadija and said, Cover me. Cover me. They covered him till his fear was over. And then he said, Oh, Khadija, what is wrong with me? Then he told her everything that had happened and said, I fear that something may happen to me. Khadija said, Never. But have the glad tidings. For by Allah, Allah will never disgrace you as you keep your good reactions with your kith and kin. Speak truth. You help the poor and the destitute. Serve your guests generously and assist the deserving, the calamity infected ones. Khadija then accompanied him to Waraka bin Nusafal bin Asad bin Abdul Usa bin Kwesi. Raka was the son of her paternal uncle, i.e. her father's brother, who during the pre-Islamic period became a Christian and used to write the Arabic writing and used to write of the Gospels in Arabic as much as Allah wished him to write. He was an old man, had lost his eyesight. Khadija said to him, Oh, my cousin, listen to the story of your nephew. And Warka asked, Oh, my nephew, what have you seen? The prophet described whatever he had seen, and Warika said, This is the same Namus whom Allah had sent to Moses. I wish I were young and could live upon the time when your people would turn you out. Allah's messenger asked, Will they turn me out? Warika replied in the affirmative and said, Never did a man come with something similar to what you have brought, but was treated with hostility. If I should remain alive till the day you will be turned out, then I would support you strongly. But after a few days, Warwick died, and the divine inspiration was also paused for a while. And the prophet became so sad, as we have heard, that he intended several times to throw himself from the tops of a high mountain. And every time he went up to the top of the mountain in order to throw himself down, Gabriel would appear before him and say, O oh, Muhammad, you are indeed Allah's messenger in truth. Whereupon his heart would become quiet and he would calm down and would return home. And whenever the period of the coming of the inspiration used to become long, he would do as before, which was walk up to the top of a mountain and attempt to throw himself down. And Gabriel would appear before him and say to him as it was before, thus preventing Muhammad from committing suicide. All right, there we have the story of how Muhammad got a bear hug, as <laughs> our, our guest put it, or otherwise put how Muhammad became a prophet. Mm -hmm. A very interesting story, all kinds of things that could be said about it. But since it's not really the subject today, uh, I won't point out many of the numerous, numerous problems of that story. But I will allow John 629 to point out one in which the story says that Warika used to write the Gospels in Arabic, you know, which supposedly did not exist. And thus Muhammad had to be called to bring the Gospel Torah same thing, right? The book to the people who spoke Arabic. Hmm. Interesting point. 
Okay. So, um, yeah. So basically you guys, uh, heard, heard the story. Um, you, you see how, um, you know, I cannot read, I cannot read and how that is linked, um, to Sura 7, I, uh, 157. Uh, I could go on and on about it, but we have a professional, professional Muslim debater, um, probably as good, if not better than, uh, Zakir Naik and his father, Ahmed Didat. Uh, Mr. Muslim Apologetics is in the house, and he's going to give the final apologetic for why this is, in fact, Muhammad, who is prophesied in Isaiah 29. Because we know that in um, the Sira or the biography or the uh, Hadith about Muhammad, we read about him uh, being uh, squeezed uh, by a bear hug by uh, the Jabril. It's really more of a... Um, a loving hug and a squeeze by Jibril and uh, Muhammad says explicitly, I can't read, I can't read, I can't read. And then he recites a part of the Quran. It is really incredible and amazing. And there is no way that you could ever possibly even remotely try to deny this. There is no way at all, you kufar. So go ahead, go ahead and try to refute it. But when you read about it, you will find that it is true. It is the most true thing that you will ever, ever read. I'm so angry. I could almost beat you, but I won't. But if you are disobedient, I might. You do look fairly disobedient to me right now, but I won't beat you right now. Well, there you go, you know. He, he says he can't read. He, he can't read, he can't read, he can't read. And then the book's given to him anyway, just like in Isaiah. I think we're going to have a very hard time refuting this passage. We might even have to read the verse before it and the verse after it. Something as wild and crazy as that. But we will go ahead and accept the challenge of disproving this claim. All right. So bringing this up. And there we go. So what is, so we're just going to basically break this down in, in, into the context, right? So you guys understand uh, how Frankfurt and Mr. Muslim kind of went through the, ba the, the back and forth here. Uh, so we're really going to break down Isaiah 29 and we're going to really contextualize this. We're going to actually contextualize it throughout the whole chapter. Um, but we're going to ask primarily, and we're going to primarily focus on answering these few questions, right? So one, is what is the context of this illiterate person, the person who says, I can't read in Isaiah 29? Who is Ariel? What will happen to Ariel? What is the dream versus what is reality? And who is this illiterate person? So what we read here is, ah, Ariel, Ariel, the city where David encamped, add year to year, let the feasts run their round. Okay, so the first question we have to be asking ourselves is in terms of defining what Ariel or who Ariel is. Uh, here in this passage, Ariel is used in two different ways. It's kind of a double entendre. First, the, the first way it talks about the uh, city where David encamped. So therefore, it's Jerusalem. It's, it's Ariel is, is Jerusalem. Uh, later, we're going to see it used in a different way way where it can also mean altar hearth or basically a place of, of sacrifice and purification. Um, so as we move forward, we start to answer what will happen to Ariel. Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be moaning and lamentation, and she shall be to me like an Ariel, right? So we see Ariel used both different ways, like we talked about there. I will distress Ariel, i.e. Jerusalem, and she'll be like to me a burnt offering or a altar hearth where there's purification that's going on. And I will encamp against you all around you and will besiege you with towers and I will raise siege works against you. It's Isaiah 29, verse two and three. So what this passage is telling us is that Ariel or Jerusalem or people, the God's chosen people will be surrounded and they will appear as if they are about to be defeated. Their enemies will think that they are about to be victorious and we see here that they will be likened to dreamers. So this is what will happen to Ariel. And you will be brought low. From the earth you shall speak, and from the dust your speech will be bowed down. Your voice shall come from the ground like the voice of a ghost, and from the dust your speech shall whisper. All right. So this is indicating how desperate 
uh, Ariel or Israel is going to be during these times of besiegement. So they will be like a ghost and faintly parted. But the multitude of your foreign foes, so this is another uh, uh extension of what will happen, but the multitude of your foreign foes, i.e. these people have you surrounded, shall be like small dust, and their multitude of the ruthless like passing shaft, and in an instant suddenly you will be visited by the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and with great noise, with whirlwind and tempest, and the flame of a devouring fire, and the multitude of all the nations that fought against Ariel, all that fight against her and her stronghold and distress her shall be like a dream, a vision of the night. Okay, so these people who are about to attack and conquer Jerusalem will actually be like a vision of the night. So let's talk about this dream. As when a hungry man dreams and behold, he is eating and awakes with his hunger not satisfied, or when a thirsty man dreams and behold, he is drinking and awakes faint with his thirst not quenched, so shall the multitude of the nations that fight against Mount Zion. So the dream is what the enemies of Ariel are dreaming, which they are dreaming that they are going to be victorious over Jerusalem. They are uh, dreaming that they are going to devour Jerusalem and conquer them. But in this passage, there's a different reality to the dream. God says, astonish yourselves and be astonished. Blind yourselves and be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and covered your heads, the seers. Right. So we're talking about how delusional these dreamers are. But the reality is the dreamers will be defeated and Ariel will, in fact, be victorious. Again, Ariel is Jerusalem. So we learn more about this dreamer, and this dreamer is illiterate. And the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. Ah, here we go. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read this, he says, I cannot read. So the issue, that, or the, what this is saying here is that the dreamer the, the enemies of, of Israel are fools, right? The dreamer here is not actually even a single person, but rather a type of person, the type of person who believes their dreams, which we read about in uh, Mr. Frank Falafel read about, sorry, Sir Frank Falafel read about um, in the account of the uh, cave of Hira, right? He used to go there and he would dream and all of his dreams would come true type of situation. Uh, but the dreamer is not his, this type of person. This is a person who is delusional, who is foolish and is blind, right? Again, this is not talking about a specific person, but rather a type of person, which Muhammad fits pretty well into being that type of person, but maybe he doesn't want to be that type of person, right? So <clears throat> the illiterate fool thinks that they are wise. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people with wonder upon wonder and with wisdom of their wise men shall, and sorry, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. <coughs> Excuse me. And the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. I.e. he's talking about people who honor him, God with their mouths, but their hearts are far from him. Kind of sounds a little bit like Jesus speaking now, isn't it? So these illiterate fools will think that they are wise. He says, ah, you who hide deep from the Lord, your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark and who say, who sees us, who knows us, you turn things upside down. So he's talking about how um, these people think that they essentially they're hiding from God and God won't know their deeds. They think they can fool men and fool God. So this is what he says. You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should say of its maker? He did not make me or the thing formed say of him who formed it. He has no understanding. So these people are going to re uh, appear religious and think that their appearance somehow fools God, but really, in reality, God scoffs at them. Um, the illiterate fools that still think they're wise 
Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind uh, shall exult in the Holy One of Israel." So we're talking about reality here. The meek, it is the meek and the weak who shall obtain joy and the poor who shall exult God. I wonder where we've heard this before. So, um, oops, I made this thing twice. Okay. Um, actually, here it is. So Jesus calls these people blessed, right? So when we talk about these people who can't see uh, or can't hear, and they will receive understanding. Jesus calls them blessed. Matthew 5, verse 3 to 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets." Who were before you. Hopefully the audience here and Thaddeus, I'm, I'm sure you're doing it as well, are drawing parallels between the Isaiah 21 passage that we were reading and to specifically mention giving sight and hearing to those who are deaf and blind. Matthew 11, four to six, and Jesus answered them, go and tell John, it's John the Baptist, what you hear and see, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news, the gospel preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Breaking into the conclusion here, that is, this is not about Muhammad, this is not about a single illiterate person, but rather a type of person who Muhammad actually does resemble, which is a fool, is blind, is wicked. However, if they want this to be, if Muslim apologists want this to be about Muhammad and we grant them that argument, then they are essentially saying that Muhammad is a fool. Muhammad is deaf, dumb, blind, and wicked. And I can't say, really can't say that I disagree with them. Can you, Thaddeus? No, I, I actually cannot disagree with them here. This is a pretty accurate description of Muhammad, or at least what Muhammad has brought upon the world, that we have billions of people today who are ignorant of the message of Jesus. They, they think they have this book. They, they think they know what God's words are, but they they have the real book available. They have the real gospel available. And they say, nope, we're not going to read that. We're going to go about our own ways. That's what the people of Isaiah's day were doing. They were saying, they you know, they didn't yet have the gospel, obviously, mm -hmm. but they had access to the scriptures. They had access to what we now call the Old Testament. And they were saying, nah, I don't need that. And I I got this, and Muhammad comes along and and says, "Yeah, you, you know that that Torah and gospel. You don't really need those. You just need me. That's all you need is what I tell you is correct." And sadly, so many Muslims today have followed that. They they are the blind people. They are the illiterate. They are the literate who refuse to read the book, making up excuses. Mm -hmm.